Okay, so welcome back to CS479 Machine Learning for 3D Data. Uh, so last time we were discussing some ideas about basically how to process some 3D geometric data in the neural net deep pipeline. So it's kind of the first the neural network. We discussed the point net, uh, which was basically the case that we are taking a point cloud as the input and basically this architecture could be applied to the multiple the applications, not only for the segmentation, but also for the cases like getting some kind of the per point information, like just getting some part segments or some semantic three segments. So here the main question was that uh, given a kind of the point cloud, which is basically a set of the points uh, where basically the order information, the index information does not have any kind of the meaning, how are we going to basically make a neural net, which becomes basically a permutation invariant uh, for some kind of the cases that we are getting some global information, and also how to make the permutation equivariant the neural network that can also basically produce some kind of per point information. Uh, you know, however, we basically uh, change the order of the points, basically the output should be uh, not affected, which means that the information that we are getting for each of the points should not be changed uh, depending, the, the, depending on the order of the points. So how we can guarantee uh, in the neural net the pipeline was basically the question we are basically uh, discussing. And also the other, the, the property uh, that also we wanted to achieve was basically the transformation, the invariance as well. So basically how we achieve this kind of the two properties are uh, basically the main topic that we discussed last time. Uh, is there someone who is turning on? So please turn off your mic and just turn on your the camera. Yeah, so that was basically the case. So, so how we can basically make some kind of the permutation invariant and the equivariant architectures. And basically for the permutation, the invariance, uh, the main idea was basically uh, incorporating some kind of the symmetric, uh, symmetric the function uh, that could be basically the max pool function, max function, or the summation or the products. Uh, so basically if we make some of this kind of the architecture, basically having some kind of the shared uh, the layers, uh, for all the data point and they basically uh, you know, taking all the, the outputs of the, the function H here with the symmetric function uh, here and then basically have some another kind of the layer uh, for the processing the outputs and this kind of the form of the function uh, could be always kind of the symmetric function that is basically guaranteeing the permutation, the invariance. Uh, so that was the main idea and also for the uh, transformation, the invariance Actually, it was very challenging to design some kind of the, uh, the architecture that can guarantee the permutation, the invariance. So the simple idea that we discussed last time was basically uh, leveraging this kind of the, the architecture, which is called the special uh, transformative network, uh, which is basically having a small the plugin into the neural network uh, that can basically predict some kind of the transformation uh, that can hopefully basically canonicalize uh, all the kind of input, the data in terms of basically aligning them uh, into some kind of the chemical frame. And basically here, the thing is that there's no guarantee that this kind of the architecture will be able to really basically you know, canonicalize all the, the data into basically mapping them into some kind of the chemical the frame, but uh, that was basically kind of the hope in terms of that. Uh, it's basically reducing the diversity of the all the input data in a way that the rest of the part of the neural net becomes much easier to be trained. So that was the basic idea. So we, the idea was that we are basically just plugging this kind of small DT net, which is taking the point cloud as the input and then outputting basically a three by three matrix uh, in a way that we, we can basically take this matrix as kind of a uh, rotation matrix. And since we cannot guarantee also that you know, this output three by three matrix is really a rotation matrix or not, uh, we are basically adding some kind of the regularization loss in a way that uh, the three by three matrix becomes closer uh, to the any kind of the orthonormal the matrix, so that was the main idea uh, of like you know basically enforcing some kind of the um uh, kind of the making some kind of neural net the architectures uh that can be more robust to the, any kind of the arbitrary the transformation uh to the all the point clouds. So basically, we discussed this kind of the architecture, uh, which is basically taking a point cloud as the input, and we are having the you know the special the transformer. Uh, which is basically first basically aligning all the input the point clouds. And then we are basically processing uh, each of the point with some kind of the shared MLP using some kind of the shared the linear layer. And then we also have some kind of the another DT net, which is also aligning the kind of the 
uh, the point clouds in the higher dimensional space uh, using some kind of another transformation in the higher dimensional space. Where, and then we are also basically adding some more the layers uh, with the NLP, which is basically shared across the all the points. And after that, we are having basically the max pool, which is basically giving us some kind of a global feature. And then we can basically further process this feature in a way to basically get some kind of the global information here. And here, one quick question is that um, can this architecture basically can basically handle you know, varying number of the points? So let's say uh, you no, know, we are basically having some kind of a multiple the point clause, and the number of the points n here uh, is basically varying across the point clause. How can it handle this kind of the case? So think about some kind of the point net implementation using the PyTorch. Uh, so in the case that you are basically implementing the point net using the you know PyTorch, TensorFlow, JAX, whatever kind of things, somehow the training data set that we are having, uh, the set of the, the point clouds are basically having all the different numbers in the points. Then how are you basically going to implement uh, the point net for such kind of the cases? Any thoughts? So if we want to basically deal with the varying number of the uh you know the points in the given training data set of the point clause, how are you going to basically implement that? Uh yeah, let, let me ask the question again. So uh also, yeah, if we want to handle the varying number of the points uh in the point net. How should we handle this kind of the case? Like one point cloud has like 1,000 points and the other point cloud has like 2,000 points, whatever. Any thoughts? Yeah. If you really have some kind of kind of the case that you no, know, you are having all the right, basically a set of the point clouds, and each of the point clouds has like varying number of the points. And let's say n is not the num just the number of the points, but let's say n is kind of the maximum number of the points across the all the point clouds that we have. Then how can you do that? Zero pegging? Would it really work? Actually, we do some, if we do some kind of the zero padding or add some kind of the zero points, that will be the case that we are adding the points at the origin of the, the coordinates, right? So it's actually changing the data. I mean, there are actually kind of like some simple kind of tricks, but in this case, that we are just taking the max pool here. Actually, what we can see is that, you no. Know, when you basically repeat, so the, here the max pool basically means that we are taking the max value for each of the dimension in the feature here, right? Uh, can you see my the drawing on uh, this slide? Uh, yeah. So basically what we can see is that even when you basically repeat some of the rows here, so let's say I just like copy some of the rows here and just like you know, attach them uh, the button like this. So when you basically just copy some of the rows here, the output of the max pool should not be changed, right? Which means that even at the, from the very beginning, when you basically copy some of the points here in a way to basically match the number of the points, the output should not be changed. So, so, so it's kind of a simple the trick uh, in terms of the implementation is that if you are basically having some varying number of the points uh, in the input, the point cloud, you can basically just like duplicate some of the points you know, way to basically match the, the number of the points, then you know, that will be the, the easiest way to basically handle the varying number of the points in the point the point of the architecture, uh, because we are using the max pool here. So if we actually we use the summation sum or the product as kind of some pooling operation here, as the symmetric function here, then we should not basically just like duplicate some of the points. But in the case that when you are basically using the max pool as our the symmetric function, then we can just consider just like repeating some of the points in the input point cloud and which will not basically affect the final output. 
Does it make sense? Well, yeah, I mean, we, we need to basically, uh, so given the set of the training data, we, we just need to uh, see the maximum number of the points and we can do this kind of the trick. But also in the test time, you know, even when you basically have some, the more number of the points, actually, you know, it should not be changed. I mean, basically the, the implementing the wise, basically even when you basically increase the number of the points in the test time, basically uh, you can just use the same the architecture just you know, changing the number of the points uh, in the PyTorch the implementation. And it should also work well, I mean, in the same way. Uh, basically, you know, all the, the layers here are basically shared across all the points. Uh, so basically, you know, it should not be changed with some kind of the deep varying number of the points. Does it make sense? I mean, so these, these are kind of some simple kind of things. And also the things that we discussed last time was basically that you know, we could basically make this kind of the architecture uh, as kind of the, the network that can also pr predict some kind of the per point uh, information. And the idea for that was basically concatenating some kind of the local feature and also the global feature and then basically feeding them into some kind of the shared MRP again uh, to get some kind of the per point information. So that was a very simple the idea in terms of like just having some kind of the uh the network that can process the point cloud the data, and when we basically uh, uh test this kind of the uh the network for some kind of the classification the test, what we also could see last time was that uh it was very you know efficient the architecture that can also get some kind of the very high accuracy even with some very few number of the kind of the values uh in the input data. So that was kind of the case. On average, how many points would a real life 3D scan have? Uh, it really depends on the scanner that you're using. So I have seen some cases like having the 3D scan the data with how many points? Billions, basically. Uh, it was basically the case like scanning the entire the warehouse, uh, very huge the warehouse. And the whole the warehouse was represented as kind of a point cloud. I think it was like billions of the points. And the size was the file, the size was like some terabytes or something. Uh, so it really depends on kind of the, the scanner that you are using. But if you use some kind of some very small, the, some, you know, uh, typical the scanners that you're using, then the number of the points can be like thousands or tens of the thousands or hundreds of the thousands. So it really depends on some kind of the, the, the scanners and also the data that you have. And also for most of the cases, even when you also have some kind of the density point clause, you may not use to you may not need to use all the information, like especially for this kind of like sim simple the classification when you want to basically uh, discriminate like the you know chairs, the tables, the airplane, or those kind of things. Uh, maybe just like few you know number of the points might be sufficient. Uh, but if you also want to basically uh, do some of the tasks that uh, needs to be basically, you know, see some kind of the details of the point clause, then we might need to basically uh, get some more the uh, the some detailed information for the objects. Yeah, well, actually, that's also a good question. So practically, like if we use the point net using some kind of the typical the GPUs that you are using uh, for your the assignment, uh, actually some kind of GPUs with just like 24 gigabyte may not be able to handle more than some you know, 100,000, even more than 50,000, I guess. Yeah. So even with the, actually the point net, which is like way more efficient architecture compared to the other, other the, uh, some 3D combustion neural net or some multi-view image based kind of neural network, uh, still it's not that easy to basically increase the number of the, the points uh, when if we just use some kind of a single GPU. Uh, so that's also kind of things. And there are also lots of the research going on in terms of like how to make this architecture to be more, even more efficient in terms of like uh, just processing them with the, uh, the similar amount of the, the GPU memories. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, and also for the segmentation, there are some kind of the results that you know, people uh, tested this architecture with the shade net, which was basically having some kind of the, some part segments like this. And also for the indoor scene as well. So, you, uh, and this was basically one of the case that the number of the points is quite big. So what they did was basically they just like cropped the entire scene uh, into some kind of the small the boxes like this, 
yeah, and then basically running the point uh, for each, each of these kind of the, the patches. So this was kind of the uh, case of like handling some larger scenes. Uh, for those kind of the cases, actually the point tenor could be effective in terms of getting some kind of accuracy. And the interesting thing, thing that we actually discussed at the very last moment in the, uh, the last time was basically that the point net is actually quite robust to the kind of the corruption of the data. So what we actually could see is that when you basically even miss the 50, the half of the kind of basically the points in the input the point cloud, actually the accuracy drop was basically just the 2%. Uh, which is very small compared to the case of like just you know, training some kind of the 3D convolution the neural net. So in the case of like just training the 3D convolution the neural net, uh, if we lose the 50% of the data, then the accuracy is also you know drops like this, drops a lot, like almost also the from the 80% to the 40%. But for the point net, actually the accuracy drop uh, for the some kind of like missing the 50% of the data uh, was basically only the two percent. Then so how uh, can this happen in terms of like how you know why the is the point in that uh, more robust is kind of like some corruption of the data? Uh, actually the reason for that is because of that we are using some kind of the we are using the max pool as kind of the, our the symmetric function. So what we discussed last time was that you know, basically we can consider basically visualizing some kind of the critical lead points. So here you know, what we mean with the critical lead points is that you know, what are the, the points? That will be basically contributing to the final the global feature. So if we see each of the dimension uh, here, basically there will be some kind of the points that will be basically giving some kind of the maximum value for each of the dimension. So we can call this kind of the subset of the points and as the critical the points. So we'll see. So we are basically taking a minimal subset of the points that are basically giving some kind of the maximum the value uh, for each of the dimension. And the interesting thing is that. If we visualize this kind of subset of the critical points, then we are basically getting this kind of the, the set of the points, which are basically capturing some kind of the geometric some features, like basically capturing some kind of the edges here, and also kind of some big, uh, some kind of the thin parts here. So obviously those are kind of the important the points to basically classify the given the point cloud. And the neural net, the point net is basically learning this kind of uh, the features from these critical the points. Which means that basically the point net is seeing that yeah these are basically important the points to basically uh do the the classification the, the the task, so that is basically the interesting the points eh? because even when we lose some of the points that are not the critical the points, so basically losing some points outside of this this subset is not basically affecting the final the outputs, so that can be actually the reason uh why this kind of the the point net becomes quite robust. Uh, to some kind of like uh, uh, missing some of the data. And also the other thing that we can do is that we can also somehow visualize the upper bound. So here, what we mean by the upper bound is that uh, the other way around, we can also consider adding some of the points that does not affect, uh, you know, uh, the final the global feature. So what we mean is that we are basically randomly sampling some points in the 3D space in a way that, you know, when you basically add this point, into the given the point cloud that does not change the final the global feature. Okay, so we can keep basically adding some kind of the new points that are sampled randomly in this 3D space in a way that even when you add a point into our the point cloud that does not change the output the you know, global feature. Then that will be basically the case that the feature uh, of this point is not giving any maximum value in any dimension, right? So when you basically process the this kind of new point uh, with the shared MLP, all the things, uh, if this point, the feature of this point is not giving the maximum value for any of the dimension, uh, then that will be the case that this point is basically not just you know, contributing to the final the global feature, right? So we can consider basically adding this kind of some you know, more the points uh, until basically that does not basically make any kind of the, you know, the changes in the final the outputs. So then we can see how many points that you know, can be basically added uh, while basically not changing any kind of the change, uh, you know, you know, not making any changes into the global features. And this is kind of the visualization for the, the upper bound. So you can see that you know, when you also basically add some kind of the points uh, in the middle of these kind of the shapes that are basically making also uh, not kind of any kind of the changes uh, in the global features, 
And also the thing is that typically the point net also and many other kinds of neural net is kind of the sort of the smooth function, right? Uh, that means that when you basically slightly you know, move each of the point here, that will not basically make also kind of the, any kind of big changes, uh, which means that even when you miss some of the critical points, not the non-critical points, even when you miss some kind, kind of the, some uh, critical the points, uh, if you have some kind of the dense enough the point cloud, then the other points that are close to the critical points actually replace the missing the critical the point. Does it make sense? So if we have like this set of the point clouds, then even when you miss some of the critical points here, then any other the points that are basically close to the, the critical the points uh, basically will play the role of that point, basically replacing the missing the critical points. And that is also the reason like why the point that becomes kind of the robust. So even when you basically miss some of the, the critical the points, then the other points that are close to the critical the points will basically play the, their roles uh, in a way that basically giving some kind of the similar the output the features. So that becomes kind of some of the reasons like why the uh, you know the point net becomes kind of like quite robust to any kind of the missing the information. And that's basically uh, happening because we are basically using the max pool as the our the symmetric the function. Uh, so that was the main idea for the point net. Uh, and also not only for the number of the, the values in the input data, but also for the, the number of the parameters that are used in the architecture. Uh, you can see that the point net is like much more efficient architectures compared to the other the, the neural network, which means that the point net and also the number of the, 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 the flow the computation uh, of the floating the point uh, is much smaller uh, compared to the other architectures, which means that point net is really uh, efficient architectures that can be uh, basically used in some kind of some portable de devices. Uh, so that is kind of the advantages of the point net. Uh, but also the limitations of the point net is that you know, typically what we can see in some kind of the, the conventional, the convolutional the architecture is basically having this kind of the hierarchical the structure that we are having some multiple the convolution the, the corners uh, while basically increasing the size of the, the receptive the field. So we are basically starting from this kind of small the conversion the corner and we are basically increasing the receptive field, field in a way to basically getting some kind of the uh, bigger the conversion the corners. Uh, but we are basically not having this kind of architecture. We are having NLP, uh, which is handling each of the single the point. And at the end, we are basically aggregating all the points uh, in the input. So there is basically just like two layers, like one layer is basically like just processing uh, each of the single point. And after that, we are basically aggregating all the points and just like processing the all the global information. So there is no this kind of some hierarchical the way to process the, the feature the data. Uh, so that's kind of the missing part in the point net. And also one of the thing is that in the case of like just making the, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, the, the some kind of convolution the neural net. Uh, we are also making some kind of the, the translation, the invariant the corners uh, in the convolution the neural net uh, the cases. Uh, while basically the architecture that we are making uh, can be actually uh, uh, somehow you know we can also achieve some kind of utilize this, the the special the transform the transformation transformer the network uh, in a way to basically achieving some kind of the enforcing some kind of the translation the invariance. Uh, but basically, this is not guaranteeing the translation the invariance. So how we can also achieve some kind of the translation the invariance might be one of the kind of the uh, the, the technical things for the point net. So that's why we are also going to uh, discuss the point net the plus plus as well. So before we move on to the point net plus plus, any questions for the point net? Do every point class are processed to the upper bound set when you put them as an input? Well, I mean, the upper bound is kind of the visualization, like, you know, you know how many, in terms of like how many points that we can add uh, while basically not changing the output, the global features. Uh, we don't need to basically add these points. Uh, So what I wanted to show here is that basically even when you, given this like the original the point cloud, we can add like the more points. Uh basically why not basically changing any kind of the uh output the features. 
So which means that uh, if we have if we have this like upper bound set, you know, however we basically you know pick some kind of the the subset of this point cloud. If we include the entire set of the critical the points in the subset, uh, then the output the features will not be changed. So which means that the the neural net uh, the point net is basically quite robust in terms of the we this kind of variation uh, taking a subset of the the points uh, in this the upper bound set uh, that does not make any changes in the output. Max size of the critical set is one thirteen four. Is there a variable strict bound? Well, I mean, if we have some kind of the you know one thousand twenty four points as the input, then obviously the critical the point set will be the subset of this, right? Then we'll be basically you know the maximum number will be obviously one thousand twenty four. And also, yeah, we are taking the maximum the dimension as the 1024, and then we are picking the points that are basically giving some kind of the maximum value for that. So the maximum number for the critical set cannot exceed uh, 1024 in any case. Is this clear? Yeah, so the motivation of like just moving on to the point in a plus plus is that, you know, this is the typical the convolution neural net we are seeing in many kind of the some the old architectures. Uh, in terms of like just having some you know uh, the convolution corners uh, that are basically processing all the local regions, and then we are basically increasing the size of the receptive field in a way to basically making some bigger the corners, uh, bigger the convolution corners in a way that they can also uh, process some kind of the more the global information in a hierarchical way. So we are starting from some kind of local information and getting into the more the global information uh, while basically increasing the receptivity field uh, in the convolution neural net. And the idea here is that how can you also re leverage the same kind of the idea of just making some kind of the shift invariant, uh, the convolution the corners using the point net. Uh, so that was the main idea of the point net, the plus plus. And you might ask, now people are not using the convolution neural net. People are using the transformers, right? Then can you also apply the idea of the transformers into the point cloud the processing? Uh, obviously, the answer is yes. There are also lots of the kind of the work uh, utilizing the transformer architectures to process the point net at uh, the point cloud. Uh, so we can also check out those kind of the papers. You can also uh, find these the name of these papers in the paper list. Uh, but let's first basically discuss this kind of the relatively old idea. And the basically the basic idea of the point in at the plus plus is that we are also doing the same thing in terms of like increasing the receptive field in the convolution the operation. Uh, we are also basically recursively basically applying this point net into the local region uh, while basically making some kind of a hierarchy. So what we can do is that we first basically sample some of the key points. So one of the ideas to like sample the key points might be just like using the idea of the farthest the point sampling. And the farthest point sampling is basically nothing, but basically the idea is that we are basically iteratively adding some new key point in a way that the new key point uh, has basically the minimum, the, uh, the, sorry, the maximum distance to the any of the key points. So basically if you have like any one, some random point, then for all the other points in the given the point plot, uh, we are finding a point which distance to the given uh, this key point becomes the maximum, right? And then now when you have like these two points, we are finding another point, uh, which distance, uh, the minimum distance to the any of these key two key points becomes the maximum, right? So we can repeat this process in a way to basically uh, spread out some of the, the a very you know, sparse subset uh, of the key points uh, over the point cloud, point cloud like this, right? So given any kind of like 1024 d points, we can consider taking this kind of seed points uh, for like 64, like 128, like having this kind of the key points. Then what we do is that we also basically uh, query some kind of the nearest the neighbors for each of the seed point in terms of like just taking some kind of the local point cloud uh, for each of the regions. Okay. And then what we can do is that basically we can also run the point net for the, each of the local point cloud. 
So we can basically also change the, the coordinate system in a way that we are just really just making uh, each of the seed points for each of the local region to be origin and just taking the local the point cloud and then processing them using the shared the point map. So now we can what you can see is that we are not just sharing the, sharing the NLP, but now we are sharing the, the entire the small the point map uh, for each of the, the local the region. Then what we will get is that uh, after like processing this uh, in the, the next layer, let's say like we started from the 124 the points. And some of, for example, like we just picked a, a subset of the points, 128 points as the kind of the subset of the points as the kind of the key points, right? And then for each of the key points, we basically ran the point net with there are some kind of local neighbors. Then at this time, now we are having some sparser point plot with 128 points. And also each of the points has some kind of the features uh, that is basically the output of the point net, right? And then we can repeat this process. Given this like 128 points, we can also basically take the even the smaller the subset of the key points, uh, run basically query some nearest neighbors for each of the key points, and basically run the point at the again. So we can repeat this process. So that's the basic idea uh, of the point at the plus plus. So we are repeating the process of like just you know, picking a subset uh, of the points as the key points and basically you know calling some kind of nearest the neighbors and basically processing them uh, all, all the local the point cloud using the shared the point net and then making this part of the point cloud with some kind of the high dimension of the, the features. Uh, the local point of like different canonical the transformation. Uh, well, yeah, typically for this kind of the case, uh, we don't use the TNN. Yeah. So that's also kind of the some issue. Yeah, that's kind of a good point. So actually what we can do is that uh, we can actually have the TNet at the very beginning uh, for the entire the point cloud. Uh, but we may not use this TNet for the local the point cloud. Does it make sense? Yeah, we can use this TNet at the very beginning for the entire the point net, and then we for the local point net, we do not use the TNet. But yeah, there are also multiple the other ways around, but that can be one simple solution. So in this way, we are really basically getting some kind of some some hierarchical the features while basically uh, reducing the resolution of the points. Basically having some kind of sparse the point clause in a way to basically get some kind of the um, the features for the sparse the points. And at the end, we're gonna basically get some kind of the uh, the features uh, for some very sparse the points. Or basically, yeah, just getting some kind of the uh, one feature uh, for the old entire the point plot. And then as we have done for the point and that for the classification the case or some other the cases that we are we want to get some kind of the global information, we can just process that into the MLP. Um, and how we can also leverage this uh, the architecture for the segmentation the case. Uh, yeah, for the segmentation, what can you do? Any thoughts on this? Okay, let me speed up a little bit. Uh, so for the, the segmentation, we can also apply the same idea, basically you know, concatenating the global feature and the local features into the points. But also the other way around that we can do is basically that we can now do some kind of the unpolling in a way that now when you have some kind of the features uh, for the you know, sparse of the point cloud, now we can consider aggregating these features into the points in the uh the higher dimension no higher the resolution of the point cloud with some kind of the pooling operation. So we can also use the max pooling here. So typically what we do is that uh now we are basically having this kind of the some symmetric architectures that now we are uh, starting from the sparser the point cloud into the denser the point cloud. Uh so for the denser point cloud like this, uh for each of the point. Now we are basically picking some kind of the nearest the key points in the previous layer, and then basically pulling out uh, all these kind of features uh, in a way to basically now uh, get some kind of the per point features in the denser the point clause. And we can also repeat this process in a way to get the uh, per point features for the all the points that we have. Does it make sense? Yeah, sorry, uh, something is going wrong with my iPad. 
Okay, so that is basically the basic idea for the point and the plus plus, but also kind of the one sort of the downside is that uh, for many kind of the cases, how does this equation do? Uh, yeah, so basically we can just uh, simply, you know, do some kind of the pulling, like the max pulling kind of things. Uh, but what people do in the point that the plus plus implementation is that they are basically doing some kind of the taking the average uh, based on the distance. So we are basically giving some higher the weight uh, when the key point is closer to the point and also giving some lower the weight when the key point is basically farther from the point. So we can take this kind of the weighted uh, the sum basically taking some average uh, of some kind of the key point features and or we can use some other kind of the pulling the techniques. But taking the uh, the weighted sum is kind of the typical the implementation. And the problem of the point net the plus plus is that you know actually the advantage of the point net is that it's quite robust uh, to some kind of the uh, some missing data and also kind of some varying the density of the points. But in case of the point net the plus plus, actually it can be quite sensitive uh, to the kind of the non-uniform kind of density of the points. Because as you can see here, if we have to really sparse the points in some local region, then there is nothing we can learn using some kind of the, the, the point net here, right? So, I mean, in the very extreme case, if we basically uh, take the seed point like this and taking this size of the ball for the, the nearest neighbor, the, uh, the coring, uh, there might be even some kind of the cases that we are having some even single point or very sparsely points in this local region. And the information that we are getting in this region will be basically the meaningless uh, in for such kind of the cases. But for the many of the cases that we are basically having the point cloud, actually there are lots of the cases that the density uh, of the points can vary uh, over the entire the space, especially for many kind of scanning the situation. Uh, the density of the points uh, in, the, in this case can vary like this. So the thing is that if we really test the point in a, the plus plus uh, with some kind of the, the cases, so like just loading some of the missing some of the data, you can see that compared to the point in it and the point in the plus plus, uh, which one is the point in it? Yeah, so the green line is the point in it. So as you can see, the point in it is not starting from some very high accuracy, but it's basically going not just you no know, uh, you know, decreasing the accuracy, even when you basically you know decrease the number of the points. But you can see is that you know uh, the for the point you know, the plus plus, we did one thousand the points. Actually, the accuracy is quite high. But as you basically decrease the number of the points in the test time, you can see that the accuracy is basically you know decreasing a lot. So the question is that how are we gonna basically handle this kind of the problem? Uh, so actually, there are some multiple the ideas for that. Uh, one of the simple idea might be is that you know we don't know what will be basically the best the you know size of the ball uh, in terms of like the coring the the neighbor the points right uh, we don't know so basically if the points are basically sparse in the local region then we might want to basically increase uh the some kind of receptive field in terms of like taking some more the points uh in the the, the you know the longer distance as kind of the nearest the neighbors if the points points are basically very dense. Uh, we might be okay to basically have some kind of a small the radius of the ball in terms of the uh, taking the nearest the, the neighbors. So what we can do is that we're just like taking the multiple scales of such kind of the balls. So sometimes we are taking uh, you know, the local neighbors in these like smaller regions and just processing them with the point net where we are basically you know, having these sides of the balls. So we are basically making some multiple the point net that can basically process the uh, different kind of the range of the basically the neighbor the points. And then we can just concatenate all these kind of features in a way that we are basically making the neural net that can process any kind of the density of the, the, the points in the local regions. So that can be kind of the one quick way to handle this kind of issues. Uh, then what would be kind of the downside of this approach? Do you see? I mean, obviously the downside of like this approach is that we, now have like uh, not only the single the point net, but actually we might basically need to have some multiple the point net to handle all the multi scales, which means that uh, this will be basically quite you know slow uh, and basically taking lots of the computation the the load. Okay. Why don't we need more points? Uh, what do you mean by like remove more points?
Well, yeah, I mean, you know, as you can see here, you know, we can basically, even when you have some kind of the very clean and very dense deep point cloud, uh, we can basically do some kind of simulation in terms of like the scanning the situation, uh, in terms of just, you know, uh, taking out some of the points so that the network becomes like more robust uh, into some kind of the, uh, some kind of the cases that like lose some data. What, what, which one is data dependent? Obviously, neural net is data dependent. So we are training our neural net in a way that you know, that can also uh, perform well in the case that when the, the density of the points are basically varying. No, we are basically randomly basically removing some points in terms of just varying the density of the points so that the network becomes more robust for the scanning scanning situation. So that's the kind of thing. So it's really hard to basically choose some kind of the criteria for the radius or the scale. So that's why we just consider just taking the multiple scales so that the each of the different scale basically, basically can handle uh, different the, the density of the, the points. Then the problem is that uh, this network becomes quite slow because now we are having some more the uh, the, the small networks in the whole, whole pipeline. But this is kind of a doable the solution. Uh, if we uh, just can take some kind of this competition the load, uh, then we can just like make some uh, the neural network with multiple skills in a way that we can handle some uh, varying the, the density of the points. So the other way, like. Uh, local regions. Yes, multiple multi-scale grouping. Yes, for each of the local region, uh, when you basically take some kind of nearest the neighbors, uh, with some kind of the uh some the the mole query, uh, we are basically varying this kind of the the size of the balls in a way to basically make some kind of the different range of the nearest the neighbors, and then each, for each of the uh different the ranges of the the nearest the neighbors, we are also making the different the point in end in a way to get some kind of the uh, different features. So which means that like in some cases that when the density of the, the local region is quite high, then the neural net might rely more on like this feature, uh, learn from some kind of the similar regions. But when the density of the local region is not that high, uh, very sparse, <coughs> very sparse <coughs> excuse me, then we're gonna basically learn now the neural net must rely more on this kind of feature uh, that is learned from the larger the receptivity field. So this is basically the best way to basically handle this kind of the varying the density of the points. Uh, the other kind of simpler the solution is that we are basically combining the idea of the point at plus plus and the point net uh, in a way that we are making one layer, which is taking the uh, disperse the point cloud in the previous layer and also taking their the features. So think about the case that we have some multiple layers, the point and the plus plus. Uh, in the previous layer, we had some kind of the, the sparse of the point cloud with some kind of the higher dimension features. Then we can basically consider basically aggreg aggregating these points uh, in a way to get some kind of the features. So that's the very typical uh, the vanilla the point and the plus plus without the multi scale, right? But instead of like taking the multi scale, what we can do is that uh, we are not basically seeing the the point cloud, the sparse point cloud in the previous layer, but we are now seeing the original the point cloud as the input and just processing them here. So basically this is kind of the case that we are repeating the first layer of the point and the plus plus in a way to basically taking the point clouds uh, in the input. So then now we are basically combining the features in the previous layer and the combined the features uh, directly coming from the input. Uh, so this come uh, so then basically by just only having the two point cloud, uh, actually we can basically combine some kind of the features uh, in some kind of the previous layer and also the features from the uh, some kind of the row points. So that can be some kind of the alternative way to basically handle some kind of the varying the density of the points. And as you can see in this plot, also the thing is that uh, so MSG uh, yeah multi scale sample. So yeah, the MSG here, the red line is the case that we have the multiple the skills. And as you can see, even when you basically simply have some multiple skills of the point net, 
uh, it become quite robust uh, in terms of like missing some of the data. But the problem of the multi-scale, the, the, the point map purpose uh, is that basically it's taking more time for the training. So without like having the multiple the skills, when you just like have these kind of like two layers combining the point net, the plus plus and the vanilla the point net, uh, we can also get some kind of the quite good accuracy uh, and also the robustness uh, into the, some of the missing data while there are still some kind of a small gap uh, between these two. So it's always good to have the multi-scale, uh, the kind of the layers in the point in the plus plus, uh, but since it basically takes kind of like longer, you know, basically more time uh, for the computation in the training, uh, we can consider basically having the multi-resolution layer uh, in terms of like just having the two point in that uh, for each of the, uh, the layer of the point in the plus plus, uh, while basically achieving the higher the accuracy and also the robustness uh, into the missing data. So this is the basic idea for the point and the plus plus. And so let me speed up a bit. Uh, so actually the, so the thing is that we can consider using this like the point net for many different cases. So as you can see, kind of the interesting thing is that you no, know, no, for the input features and also the distance things. So what we need uh, to basically process the point at the plus plus is that uh, we are taking some features from the each for each of the points for each layer, right? So we basically take some kind of features for each of the layer, and what we can see is that in the intermediate layers, now some kind of the features for each of the point becomes not only the x y z coordinates, but basically the features that are, we are learning from the previous layer, right? So we can consider basically taking these features. Uh, so, and also starting these features not only from the x, y, z coordinates, but some kind of some intrinsic features. Uh, for instance, basically when we uh, train the point net with some kind of some organic shapes, uh, some or some non-rigid shapes like some animals or the human body shapes or these kind of things, then you know what we can see is that even when you have some of these kind of the pool changes. Uh, of the some animal the bodies, we know that these are basically the same the cat, right? So we can basically consider having some kind of the uh, some three D features taking some of these three D features. So we are not gonna get into so all the details here. Uh, this will be basically discuss more in the geometry the processing the course, but we can basically consider taking some kind of the classical the ways uh, to define some of these kind of local features the points uh, in a way that we are basically providing some information for each of the points. Uh, which becomes like uh, quite uh, you know, invariant into all these kind of the pose changes uh, of the kind of some animal body shapes or the human body shapes. Then so, this might be more effective uh, in terms of like learning for from this kind of the non rigid shapes. So this is like one thing we can do. And also the other thing is that uh, in the point in the plus plus the architecture, basically we are calling some kind of the nearest neighbors, right? So we have this kind of step, like just taking the some neighbor the points and processing the those the local points with the point net. Then also the question here in my page is that when you basically query some kind of the neighbor the points, what sort of the distance metric that we're gonna use? Right. So we basically discuss the idea like we're just taking the some nearest neighbor in the some the Euclidean space in the three D space, but instead of like just taking the points that are basically closed in the 3D space. Actually, if we have some kind of the surface information uh, for the given shape, then we can consider like just pouring the points that are closed over the surface, not in the 3D space, right? So basically, if we can basically measure the distance over the surface like this, so this is like basically like one example. We know that for those two points, this and this, uh, in the 3D space, these two points may not be that far, right? So if we just take the kind of ball like this, then we're gonna say that this is also kind of the sort of the neighbor of the other the points, right? But in over when we basically measure the distance over the surface, we know that these two points are not close to each other. It's actually quite far, right? Which means that if we take the uh the distance metric, not as the distance in the Euclidean space, but as the distance over the surface, then we will be able to get some better the idea in terms of like what are some kind of the real the points. That are close to our the seed point. So basically, by changing this kind of the distance symmetry, we can, especially for the cases that when you basically 
handle some kind of the organic shapes, uh, we can basically consider improving the point and plus plus the architectures and also getting some kind of the way higher the accuracy. Uh, so that's the basic idea of like uh, handling some kind of the uh, non rigid shapes. So if we also go further, one question, how can you measure using example when you only have the point cloud information? Well, yeah, that's, that's a thing. So if we only have the point cloud, uh, it's not that easy to measure the, the geodesic distance. Uh, so one simple way for that is that we are seeing the point cloud as not just the set of the points, but we can consider basically connecting these points based on the, their the proximity. Uh, so when the points are very close to each other, we can basically connect them. Then we are basically seeing not just a point cloud, but just seeing a graph. Then actually we can measure the distance over the graph. And the other way around would be basically we are converting the point cloud into some kind of impulse function and convert that into the mesh and measuring the geodesic distance over the mesh. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of things. And also the example that I have shown in the previous slide is that basically that can be actually the case that actually the, the raw the input data uh, were not actually point clouds, but like some kind of the meshes or some other the representation. But you no, know, to basically utilize this kind of point and the plus plus kind of architecture, we can actually sample the points uh, over the row the shape. Then actually, since we if we have some kind of the other the row the, the data like the meshes, then on that basically the data we can basically measure the geodesic distance while sampling the points. So that can be also one kind of the way. Uh, okay, and we are running uh, very late, so let's move on to the thing. So basically we can also consider basically generalizing this idea of the point and the plus plus. So this was basically uh, things that what we are doing uh, in the each of the layer in the point and the plus plus, uh, having some kind of the uh, features for each of the points and processing them uh, with some kind of the, the shared MLP layer uh, and then taking the max pole, right? So this is the basically the point net, the small the point net, uh, which is basically used as some kind of the, the component of each layer in the point and the plus plus way. Then, but basically we, what we also have seen is that we can make any kind of the you know, symmetric function into this form, right? If we have the symmetric function here uh, and some kind of the, uh, some, the function uh, processing the local features, uh, F and G, then we can basically make some lot of the variation uh, of the, like all the, the symmetric function, right? And here, one small difference with the typical the point net is that now we are having the seed point, uh, which is the I, and we are taking the seed point and they are the neighbors. And based on this, we can process them into some kind of the uh, shared function. Of course, the all the neighbor the points and take the some kind of the some pooling function, this metric function, and further process with the G. And by just you know, taking different the choices of like these three functions, uh, we can make some kind of the variation. And there are lots of the ideas for that. Uh, one of the kind of simple idea for that is basically doing some kind of the, not taking the max pool, but take, taking some kind of the weighted sum uh, by just taking the weight uh, based on the distance. So this is the case that now we are having the distance function D here and also the Gaussian color, uh, which basically means that we are giving some kind of the weights for each of the nearest the neighbor the, the points uh, depending on the distance. So if the points are basically close, uh, then we are basically giving the higher the weights. If the points are the further, we are giving some kind of the lower the weight. Uh, in a way, in this way, we can uh, instead of like just taking the max pool of the all the features, we can consider taking some uh, weighted sum like this. So this is like the one D variation. And also, as you could basically uh, expect to see, uh, as I also as I mentioned in the the all the the, the previous slides. Uh, actually, we can consider the given the point cloud as kind of a graph. So one simple way that we can consider this the point cloud as the graph is that as I just said, we can basically you know connect some kind of the some uh, close the points, uh, and then we can consider the given the point cloud as, as kind of the graph. Then we can consider uh, utilizing some kind of the some other some graph neural net the architectures uh, to process not only the graphs but actually also the points as well. So you can see that the one of the idea of the graph neural net actually can, can be considered as kind of like some one of the variation of the point at the plus plus, uh, which is basically nothing but just taking all the neighbor the points uh, and processing them uh, and then summing up all the features and then also uh, add them into the features of the seed point. So also instead of like in taking the sum here, 
uh, actually we can just like concatenate these two features. So this is also another way to make some kind of deviation. And this is also another kind of simple way. Uh, instead of like just directly taking the features for each of the, the neighbor the points, we can take some kind of the uh, the vector uh, into the the relative the, the positions. So we are basically taking this kind of difference of like two features, uh, taking this vector as the input and processing them uh, using some kind of the uh, architectures. And also we can basically uh, feed all this information uh, into the neural net. So this is these are like all the kind of like different ways to make some kind of the some variations uh, of the, the point and the plus plus. And also here, like basically, like one important thing is that uh, as also I said in the previous slide, uh, sorry. Uh, here basically we could consider like different way to define the distance. So when you query the neighbor points, uh, we could consider different ways to basically define the distance here. And also what we can do is that we can basically query some kind of the neighbor the points, not based on the distance in the Euclidean space, in the 3D space, but actually we can consider these features, the learned features in the previous layer as kind of the space, the feature space as kind of the, the space where basically we can uh, define some kind of the new distance of the points. So here the point is, is that like for each of the new layer, now we are basically taking some kind of the neighbor points, the neighbor points not in the 3D space, but the neighbor points in the feature space. So every layer, we are not only just like simply updating the features for each of the points, but we are also updating the way that we are defining some kind of the neighbor the points. So if we see the, the point cloud as kind of some sort of the graph structure uh, based on the proximity of the points, now we are also changing the proximity of the points, every layer in terms of like the changing the graph structure as well. Right, make sense? Yeah, so that's basically the idea of the, the dynamic the graph CNN in terms of that, uh, when you take some kind of the nearest the neighbor the points, uh, we are not the, taking the neighbor uh, points uh, based on the, the, the distance in this 3D space, uh, but based on the distance in the feature space. And these features are basically learned in the neural net. So we are basically utilizing the neural net not you know, only in a way to basically just update the features, but also in a way to basically update the distance across the points. So that can be also kind of the uh, kind of the, the, the way that we can upgrade uh, the point in the plus plus. And can you see the downside of like this idea? The problem with like this idea is that, which means that we need to do some kind of the, some nearest the, the neighbor point equality, the search. Uh, in the high dimensional space. So in the typical the point at the plus plus, we just need to basically find the neighbor points in the 3D space. Three dimensional space is quite low dimensional space. But if we start to basically find some neighbor the points in the higher dimensional space, then it becomes very uh, inefficient in terms of the computation. The, the computation becomes super expensive as the dimension of the space becomes very larger. Uh, so that's kind of the downside of like using the, the dynamic the graph CNN. So this is also called the DGCNN. Uh, but it is also known that DGCNN performs quite well in terms of the giving some very high accuracy, uh, but the competition time is like much slower. So that's kind of the problem. So and then can learn some bad geodesic distance. Yes, it's, it's possible. The neural net, uh, we don't know what sort of the distance the neural net would learn, but the neural net will try to learn the best the distance metrics that can give us the best the, the accuracy for the given task. Uh, so we don't know what sort of the distance metric the neural net would learn, uh, but basically we can train the neural net in a way that it can basically learn some kind of the metric that give us the best performance in the final the output. And actually it works in terms of like improving the, the accuracy. So as you can see, you know, if we basically use some kind of the, uh, the DGC and then the idea, then they can basically give some kind of the best the performance at the end. Uh, the problem of the, the DGCNN is that uh, it just takes way longer time in the training because basically we need to basically query the neighbor the points in much high dimensional space. So that's kind of the idea uh, of like just you know, upgrading the point net plus plus. A quick wrap up is that the point net was the case that we are basically uh, processing kind of the unordered uh, the set of the points. Uh, we could extend this idea into some kind of hierarchical structure uh, into the point net plus plus. 
And the DGCNN was basically the case that we also uh, varying the proximity across the points in a way that basically we can uh, basically you know make some kind of some dynamic some prep structures of the points and improve the accuracy. And actually, there are tons of the uh, the variance of the point then. Uh, this is is also a very small subset uh, of the the variance of the, the point net. So if you are also interested, in, uh, you can also check out some of the recent work. Uh, also, there are some kind of the ideas uh, making some applying the transformer the architectures to process the point net, uh, the point cloud. Uh, you can also check out all these kind of the other the ideas. Uh, but this is actually not the main topic that we wanted to discuss. So let's move on to the next topic. Any questions on this? Okay, uh, so we don't have enough time, but let's move on. Uh, so actually what we wanted to discuss as kind of the main topic for today is basically how to also make the point cloud decoder as well. So the idea of the point net, point net plus plus, these things, and these are basically the architecture of the neural net that can process the point cloud as the input. So we can basically take the point cloud as the input and basically get some kind of some global feature or some kind of any global information or some per point information, right? Uh, and based on that, actually we could consider making another neural network, they can now process the, you know, generate the point cloud as the output. So not for today, but later we're gonna also discuss some of the ideas of like 3D generated models uh, that can basically populate all different types of the kind of the 3D uh, the data that can be represented as kind of the point cloud or some other representation. So there is also uh, lots of kind of things that we need to discuss in terms of like how we gonna make this kind of some 3D uh, generated models. But these are basically the cases that we are basically creating this kind of the objects uh, from nothing. Uh, so we are basically uh, just populating all these 3D the models using some kind of degenerative doing models. But we can also consider making some kind of architectures that is basically reconstructing some 3D shapes from some kind of the given input. So the input can be text, whatever kind of things. Like one example might be is that given a this kind of the image, how we can make some kind of the 3D output that is basically uh, matching the, the given the input image. So this will be the case that uh, we might need to have some kind of the some point cloud decoder uh, that can basically produce some 3D the point cloud like this. So for this kind of the, the, the task, we can consider, I mean, there are also lots of the, the bunch of the other the way arounds uh, doing this kind of the, the task, uh, but we can consider making a framework. Uh, sorry. Um, that we, we are having the, for example, like image encoder. So this encoder is now taking the image as the input, uh, having some kind of the global the latent features for the uh, input the data, and then making some kind of the decoder that is now producing the, the point cloud as the output, right? So this will be the simplest way that we can make a neural net that takes the image as the input and 3D as the output, right? Obviously this is like too simple, so I mean, uh, yeah. But let's think about like this simplest case, like how we're gonna make some kind of the, the point cloud decoder so let's skip all the things. Obviously, there are also a bunch of the ways in terms of making some the point cloud decoder. And actually, we're gonna see that actually uh, taking the point cloud as the output uh, of the, the neural network is actually not the best idea. We also discussed uh, other the representations. So we're gonna also see some other types of the kind of decoder that can produce the 3D data into the other representation. But basically, let's think about the, this kind of the case. So we are having the image encoder and we are having the point cloud decoder. And then actually we have the ground truth. We have the correct answer in terms of what sort of the 3D point cloud that we want to get from the given the input image. Then we should be able to basically compare this too, right? So this will be very typical during the, during the architecture that we're having the image encoder and the point cloud decoder, having the output, the point cloud, and we basically compare this output with the ground truth that we are having and basically minimizing the, this difference as kind of a loss function and just backpropping the, the neural network in a way to basically train uh, all the parameters, right? So, and also for the point cloud decoder, I mean, we are not gonna see any kind of the fancy idea. The simplest architecture might be this kind of kind of things, just making having like simple the NLP in terms of like just increasing uh, the dimension of the input, the global feature into the higher dimensional feature like this. 
And if we just like divide uh, this long d vector into these three, these small d pieces, uh, we can consider that this output becomes the x, y, and the z coordinates. So this will be the simplest architecture for the decoder. But actually, the main topic that we are going to discuss for today is basically how we're going to define the loss function for this. So given a kind of the ground truth, the correct answer of the point cloud, and also the point cloud that we are getting as the output of the new point uh, of the, the neural network, how are we going to basically measure the discrepancy between these two, the, the distance uh, between these two? So this is actually the main thing that we need to discuss for today. Uh, do you have some kind of the any ideas in terms of like how we can define this distance, chamfer distance? So basically, we're going to see three different types of the distance. Uh, so there are basically very common the, the ideas of like measuring uh, the distance between the two point clouds. So let's think about like this case. We are having a point cloud uh, with the blue points here. And also the points, uh, sorry, I'm going to call this one. Blue points. And then also the green point here, right? So we are having a two point clause here. And actually there can be multiple ways that we can define the distance between these two. And actually the thing is that the most, uh, the famous, the popular way to define the distance between these two point clause was actually Hausdorff distance. So what we basically measure with the Hausdorff distance is that, uh, so check out this formula. You can see what this means. So if you see what this equation means here is that given for each of the point in the, the point in the point cloud the x, we are basically finding the closest point. So for each of the point, uh, we are finding the closest point here. And measure the distance to the closest point and take the maximum of them. So if we, from the, all the points from the blue here, uh, if we find the closest points and take the maximum of, of those D distances, then the, the maximum might be this one, right? And we also do the same thing for the other way around, for the green points as well. So for all the green points, you also find uh, basically closest point to the blue points like this and take the maximum. And you also take the maximum of like these two. So what we are seeing is that we are trying our best in terms of like finding the closest points for each of the point. And then we are seeing the worst case. So what would be the worst case in terms of like finding the closest point? So the worst case here might be basically having this point, right? So if we have like this point, the closest one might be this one, which is actually quite far. So basically what we are seeing is that given the two sets of the points, we are seeing the basically the worst pair in terms of like what are the basically some kind of the outliers in terms of like avoiding the alignment of like these two points. So actually this was the, the very the conventional and the typical the ways of like just measuring the distance of the two points because actually it makes sense, right? Even when you have like, such, like very few points uh, that are basically becoming some kind of the outliers, actually these outliers are basically uh, you, know, you know, define this kind of discre discrepancy uh, between the two points, the point sets, right? So that is basically the idea of the house drop the distance. And actually we can use this the distance function as the loss function uh, to basically train a point, uh, point cloud decoder. But then can you see what would be kind of issue with that? If we basically have this like the, far, the, the house drop distance as kind of the metric for the uh, to you know, to basically train a kind of the point uh, cloud decoder. Well, actually, we can assume that the, given the ground to the point clouds are basically clean points, 
And we really want to basically avoid having any kind of the alliance in our the outputs, right? So this can be really the case that we want to basically uh, achieve some kind of the point cloud that are ma not making any kind of this kind of outliers. So in terms of like having the loss function, it can be good. Actually, the problem is that if we think about like really just running the gradient descent with this loss function, what we are going to do is that, you know, we're gonna only basically see this single pair of the points. So what you can see is that, let's say if the, the blue is kind of the ground truth, and the green is kind of the points that we are basically predicting, then what we are going to do with this loss function is that we're gonna only update these points. So every single kind of the iteration uh, in the gradient descent, we are only updating a single point. Why are we gonna have some way more number of the points there? And it's like the 1,000, right? So basically the training will be very slow because we are only updating one single point through the, you know, the back propagation. Does it make sense? So that's the, actually the only the downside. Actually, it's okay to use the house of the distance as kind of the, your loss function uh, to train your the autoencoder or some kind of the point cloud the decoder. Uh, the downside is that for every iteration, you are only updating a single point while you are having like lots of the other points. So the training will be super slow. So that's kind of the issue with the like using this kind of the more the conventional the distance the metric. Actually, this was the very conventional the metric to measure the distance between the two point clouds. Uh, but people are not using this distance as kind of loss function to train the decoder uh, because of the, this issue. So the other way around is basically having this like the earth mostly distance. So here what we do is that we are basically doing finding some kind of the best one-to-one -one the matching in terms of like minimizing distance between these two. So when we basically assume that the number of the points in the ground truths and the outputs are basically exactly the same, we can first consider basically finding the best one-to-one -one the correspondences uh, for all the, the pairs, uh, for all the points like this. So we are first finding the pairs of the all the points. And then we are basically minimizing the distance between this kind of the pairs of the points. So that's the basic idea of the earth's mostly distance. Uh, so let me skip some details here because we are running out of time. Uh, then what would be the kind of the, the issue uh, when you basically use this like earth mostly distance? Uh, if we also use this idea of the earth mostly distance uh, for training uh, some kind of the point cloud decoder, uh, what would be kind of issues? Yeah, actually, finding the best the pairs of the points is doable, uh, but it just takes some time, right? So computationally, there might be kind of the, the case that we are finding uh, the best the bipartite matching, uh, which the time complexity is n cubic, right? So which means that every time in the iteration of the gradient descent, uh, we need to basically run this you know, bipartite matching, which takes the, uh, the time complexity of the n cubic, and which means that it will be also very slow. So while we can basically update all the points in this case, uh, it is basically taking time to find the, all the kind of the best pairs of the points. So that's the issue of the EMB. Why is it slow? Because we need to find the best matching between of course the points, right? So basically what we do here is that uh, we are finding the best one-to-one -one the matching uh, between the points in the output and the points in the ground truth in a way that the distance between these points are basically minimized, right? So we first basically find uh, this kind of the one to one correspondences across the points and then minimizing distance for the given the pairs. And actually it takes time to find this mapping. Uh, basically, you know, this will be basically the problem that we are solving basically the bipartite matching problem. Uh, and the, the time complex for that is the NQB. So basically you need to eat, you know, iterate uh, this every iteration of the gradient descent. So that will be kind of reason that when, why it takes like, lots of the time. I mean, obviously there can be some kind of tricks to basically reduce this competition, but yeah. 
So this is basically some kind of the limitation of the some, some downside of like using the earth's most distance. And actually the idea of like using the chamfer distance actually came as kind of some kind of remedy uh, of like all the limitations. Um, in how slope distance mod be time complexity. Well, I mean, you can guess uh, this will be, so without any kind of the, any efficient search, the idea of the power stroke distance is that for every single point here, you will just need to find the closest points, right? So in the some very naive search without any kind of some uh, some searching kind of the algorithm, uh, for each of the points you need to find the closest points. So that will be the case that we are just taking n qubit, you know, n, n square, right? And obviously we can we are not gonna just use some you know just compute the distance to all the points. We can consider using some kind of the more uh, efficient, some kind of the KD trees type kind of data structure uh, in a way to also boost up uh, the search the computation. So if it takes like log n time complexity to find the closest points, then the complexity might be n log n, right? So let me some skip some details here. Uh, so now this, that's why basically uh, people basically came up with this idea of like the chamfer distance, uh, which is basically may not be the ideal kind of the metric, but it can be basically good in terms of like training the, uh, the neural network. So what we do here is that now we, we are not basically finding the best one-to-one uh, -one correspondences, but for each of the point, we just find the closest points. But we are not just taking the maximum uh, of the, all the pairs, but we are basically taking the uh, sum of the minimum distance from each of the point to the other the points. So this is kind of the some kind of the approximation kind of things of the house dwarf distance or the earth most distance, uh, which is not exactly giving the same distance, uh, but which can be quite effective in terms of training the point cloud the decoder in terms of that we don't need to find uh, you know, any kind of the one to one correspondences. So we can avoid that computation, finding the one to one correspondences. And also this is still a kind of loss function that we can basically update all the points. So we are not taking only the single pair, but we are updating all the points at once uh, in the gradient descent. So this can be basically quite effective uh, in terms of like training the point cloud decoder. So that's the basic idea, like, like why people are using the chamfer distance as the loss function uh, for the point cloud, uh, you know, the decoder, but this does not mean that we don't need to use the chamfer distance uh, to measure the distance between the two point clouds in the other the cases. So actually the thing is that chamfer distance is the metric uh, that is quite effective to train the neural net, but it does need to be kind of the, the best kind of distance metric for all the cases of like measuring the distance between the points. So that's the basic idea. So basically, if you can basically have this kind of the loss function uh, to train some kind of the, uh, the point cloud decoder, then now you can basically take the point net, the, the architecture, taking some global feature as your the encoder and make some kind of simple the MLP the decoder architecture and train this like full the autoencoder uh, using the chamfer distance or some other kind of the or some most distance or some uh, distance in metrics. And implementing this autoencoder will be you're the last the task in the first assignment. So that's what we are going to, yeah, that's what we discuss here. Any questions on this? Yeah, so we couldn't have time to discuss some other details for the uh, earth movers distance and also the other things. So please check out uh, these slides. Uh, I, I also posted all the slides in our the course web page. And we will need to basically move on to the implicit function next week. So we're going to discuss the uh, implicit neural representation uh, next week. And then we're going to move on to the neural rendering uh, next time. Any questions? OK, thank you. Bye.